Good morning and welcome to our today's lecture. So today we are going to talk about equivalence uh, as actually we continue to discussion. So we discussed from different translators and academicians perspective that how actually we can achieve this equivalence while translating. Now today we are going to focus on Kohler and his correspondence and equivalence that we actually suggested. So let's see what we have here. Now, uh, as you can see in the, in the second slide, it says that uh, we have already come to know that how actually Nida actually he tried to make it very scientific and to prove it very scientific in his work of translation and especially uh, these equivalence, uh, this equivalence part. Now, uh, now we will also consider that how Nida's this move towards this I mean, science of translation, how actually it has influenced the German. Uh, you can say the German translators or German academicians you know, from their point of view, how actually they took and borrowed the idea from Nida's uh, correspondence and equivalence. So now here we see Nida's move towards a science of translation proved to be especially influential in Germany, where the common term of translation studies is, it's a German word that is translation science. So you see, they call it translation science and they took it from Nida's idea in Germany. Among the most prominent German scholars in the translation science field, translation science field, uh, during the 1970s and 1980s, were Wolfram, Wolfram Wells, of the, you see this is the name of the university, and we call it Salandus, uh, including, Otto, uh, and also there are someone from the Democratic Republic, okay, the Democratic Republic, the late, the late Czech school, including Otto Kate, and Albrecht Duver. So, see, these are the people, even if you don't remember the names, it doesn't matter, just remember the name Kohler, how actually he influenced it or how he designed it. So, you can see that in different universities, these translators or the academicians or educators, you can see they were highly influenced by Nida's framework. Now, in the next slide, here you can see that the important work on equivalence was also carried out by Warner Kohler in Heidelberg and Bargain. Colors, it's a very difficult name in German. Uh, we can see it in translation in English. It says, it says, research into the science of translation examines more closely the concept of equivalence and its link term of the correspondence. So, how actually it has <coughs> contributed? So, we can see it here that how, I mean, this research into the, into the science of translation, how actually he formed uh, this equivalence and correspondence structure. Now in the first slide, here you can see that the, the, the correspondence falls within the field of constructive, contrastive linguistics, which compares two language systems and describes differences and similarities contrasted. Uh, if you have idea this, con, con, uh, with the, we call it contrastive analysis, especially in phonetics and phonology, you have found it, and also in linguistics and different other fields, when actually we want to compare between two different languages, we use contrastive linguistics. That means the linguistic forms and contents and the structures. For example, the linguistic forms, contents, are, and the structures of Bangla, and the linguistic linguistics forms and structures and contents of English. So when we put together these two different languages, when we put them together and we try to find the difference between these two, we call it contrastive analysis. Or contrastively, we are trying to compare a two particular or two different languages. Is, is it understandable? Do you follow what I'm saying? So please say again. The contrastive analysis of the contrast number of the AO, Japan number due to language action. Do you get it? Do you get what I'm saying? Due to language means, for example, we'll take Bangla and also we'll take English, two languages together. Understood? Okay, sir. Okay, yes, sir. So we we'll put them side by side. Then we'll try to compare the, uh, I mean, what actually we have in one language. For example, the structures, grammatical, uh, grammatical uh, stuff, and also the syntax, semantics, morphologically, how actually they are different. So we'll put two languages together, and then we'll compare with one language with another language. That is contrastive analysis. Or we can say that we are finding the contrast between two different languages. So through this contrast, we will try to 
find out the, uh, you can say, the, actually what we have inside the language. And then we will use those characteristics or those traits, those features of two different languages uh, in our translation. So for determining your translation uh, work, or, I mean, you can say the, uh, to determine your translation work and how actually it will be. So we will try to contrast between, find the contrast between two different languages. That's actually you can transfer or uh, transmit the one language, I mean, uh, one language, uh, you can say its features into another language while translating. Until and unless you have a clear idea about the two different languages and their structures, it will be difficult for you to transfer the meaning and the content and the form of the one language into another language. Okay, so that's why we need to make the contrast. We need to find the similarities and contrast between two different languages. Now, here it goes further in this way. It says that uh, its parameters are those of Sasu's language. You see, remember, uh, I mean, the father of the Sasu actually he introduced, especially in the structuralism, while actually he was discussing the structuralism. There, actually, we have seen the idea of Langlo and Paro. Remember that Langlo and Paro? Do you, do you remember that? What is Langlo, not is Paro? Okay, so you see the Paro, uh, uh, that is the abstract artist. Uh, I mean, it is independent of the users, individual users, and also it is independent of the individual users. Actually, how he uh, defines it, it doesn't matter because parallel is the abstract form. That is the common form from everybody. Or we can say that is the forms and we individuals contributed to, uh, I mean, structure that form, uh, I mean, the abstract form for centuries. For example, we're using Bangla for the last 200 years or maybe 400, 1000, 2000 years. So these, forms actually it is the contribution of the individual so a particular individual he is not solely responsible for these abstract forms so it is constructed by the society um, centuries after centuries so you see as an individual i simply can't change the whole abstract forms but i can contribute maybe after 100 years the shape of english or shape of bangla will be different because of my contribution but individually i cannot contribute directly and that is not visible in that sense so that is the parent. Lang, a lang is the language, or lang, that is the actual use of the language. So lang is the actual use of the language, the way actually we use it the language. So there is abstract forms of the parent, and language is the actual use of the language. Understood what I'm saying? And these parameters are those, those are set by Sassus in his language parent discussion. Okay? Have you got it? Yes, sir. Is it clear? So, uh, yes, sir. okay, for your easy understanding, I can just simplify it in this way. Parallel is the rules and regulations or the structures, you can say that is abstract. And language is the practical use of the language, the way we use that language. Okay. So, in most cases, you will find that the parallel, that is some, uh, in most cases, that is very, uh, it is in our subconscious mind. All the time, you're not conscious about the rules and regulations. For example, when you use Bangla, do we think about the structure, the syntax all the time? Subject, verb, argument. No, think? sir. It comes automatically, right? Right, sir. Why yes, did sir. it happen? Because of the abstract rules. It is innate. It is there in our mind. Okay, that's right. Now, examples given by Polar are the identification of false friends and signs of lexical, morphological, and, syn and syntactic interference. So, actually, Polar, he try to identify the false friends that, I mean, the, in the correspondence and equivalence, sometimes you might get confused that, okay, this is the equivalence, this is the corresponding equivalence, this is like that. But sometimes between the two different languages, if I fail to identify it correctly, the morphological, lexical, and syntactic interface, if I cannot find it properly, or the, I mean, the contrast and the similarities, if we, if we can't, if you're not able to find it properly, then there might be false friends. That means we might get confused and my translation work will not be proper. So that's why we have to identify it properly. Now let's see what you have in the next slide. Okay, there you see. Now he's talking about equivalence. So that is the corresponding. I mean the correspondence he's talking about. Now equivalence on the other hand relates to equivalent items in a specific uh, source text and target text pairs and context. So equivalence is a specific thing. It's specific items between source text and the target text. That what is equal. So in the corresponding, we'll find the contrast, and in the equivalence section, we'll find the equivalence. What are the things that are same in the source text and also in the target text? So we'll try to find out that. The parameter is that of 
So it shows parallel. So you can see the length is the actual use. That is the correspondence. Understood what I'm saying? Length is the actual use. So actual use in the source text and actual use in the target text. So that we'll find out in the correspondence. In the equivalence, we'll go for the parallel. That means that is the abstract rules, the ideas, whatever we have. So importantly, Kohler points out that while knowledge of correspondence is indicative of competence in the foreign language, it is knowledge and ability in equivalences that are indicative of competence in translation. However, the question still remains as to what exactly has to be equivalent. Uh, I also personally believe that that sometimes this idea of correspondence and equivalence actually they overlap. So there is no hard and fast rules. You cannot say that this is equivalence and this is correspondence. Sometimes they will overlap. But thing is that at the end of the day, as a translator, or you can see as a novice or as a student of translation studies, we have to have some basic understanding about the language and Lang and Perot, and also about the basic understanding of correspondence and equivalence. Does actually we can use it properly. Even if we don't know that whether it goes with equivalence or whether it goes with the correspondence, it might be confusing. Sometimes it might, uh, you can say overlap, but still we can use it. Even if you don't know the exact, you can see the demarcation line when it is to the equivalence and the correspondence. That's why it says that, that points out that while knowledge of correspondence is indicative of competence, so if you have the correspondence, that means the lang, that is your competence in the foreign language, that means you can use it. Linguistic competence, that means that you can use that language. You know the rules and you can implement it. You can implement those rules when actually comes the actual use in the context. That is lang. And parallel is the abstract qualities, abstract ideas, abstract rules. Okay, and that is independent of the individual users. Okay, so it is knowledge and ability in equivalence. So you see the knowledge and ability. Ability means you can use it. What does it mean ability? Ability means we can use it in the actual language. That is slang. That is indicative of competence in translation. That means if you can use that language properly, then you are a user of that language. I mean, you, are, you have a very good command over, over that language. And then you will be a competent translator. So that's it's an indicative of competence in translation. Okay, understood? Uh, you need further explanation. Your students, are we up? Our timing is running out. Is it okay? Okay, sir. All right. Now, here is the chart. You can see the chart, right? Can you see the chart? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that's it. Now, here you see the differentiation of equivalence and correspondence. So Kohler actually in 1979, he suggested this in his book. So here you see the equivalence and correspondence. How are the different? So you see, this is the field, research area, and knowledge and competence. And contrastive linguistics here, you see the correspondence phenomena and conditions describing corresponding structures and sentences in the second language, uh, I mean, source language and the target language systems. While equivalence, the science of translation. So you see the constructive linguistics that will deal with the correspondence. And equivalence is the actual use, that is science of science of uh, translation, you see, equivalence. Here actually it, it comes the, um, in the parallel, and there actually it goes the length in the first, first section. So it's the equivalence phenomena describing hierarchy of utterances and text in source language and target language according to equivalence criteria. That is parallel. So you see, knowledge is language, and here knowledge is parallel. Here competence is foreign language competence, and here competence is translation competence. If I go back, you can see equivalence, competence in translation. You see equivalence in these, I mean, uh, on the slide five, I've already mentioned it. that is, it deals with the parallel. Equivalence deals with the parallel, okay? That is the abstract rules, knowledge. Here you see, equivalence phenomena, describing hierarchy of utterances and texts. So that it will analyze the text and utterances in the source language and also the target language according to equivalent criteria. So there will be certain parameters in both languages, and then you have to find out the similarities and the constructed con contrast, contrast between these two languages. So that is parallel. And there lies the translation of competence, because if you know this, then you can translate it correctly or properly. If it is, even if it is not absolutely correct, but at least that very close to the original text, I mean the source text. All right, so here knowledge is lang, lang and you can see the competence of foreign language competence because you see lang means the actual use of the language so actual use means you can use that language 
as a translator and as a, also as a learner, as a teacher, as an academician, you can use that language. That is foreign language competence. For example, all of us, we can speak English and also we can write in English. So that is our foreign language competence. So all of you have language, okay? And also we have some pattern in our mind, the abstract rules of English language is there. In so we have both of these, language and pattern. Now we can translate it properly from source text to target. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fantastic. Now, now here you see, in an attempt to answer this question, Kona C also, you see, goes to describe five different types of equivalents. So he has categorized, I mean, these equivalents into five different categories. So now it will help us to understand it quite clearly. Here you see, number one is denotative equivalent. You know what is what does it mean denotative? That is the exact meaning of the word. That means H2O means water, water means water, it's nothing else. But connotative meaning or equivalence that will be different. It's not the exact meaning. So you see that is related to denotative uh, uh, equivalence is related to equivalence of the extra linguistic content of a text. Other literature, says scholar, calls these content invariants. So they call it content invariants. That means that it based on the content. Because denotative means the exact meaning. That is extra linguistic. That means it's beyond the linguistic. You have to take the context, and you see this water means water. That is it, and you understand it. Okay. On the other hand, connotative equivalence is related to the lexical choices, especially between near synonyms. Kola sees this type of equivalence as elsewhere, being referred to as a stylistic equivalence. So connotative equivalence is not the exact meaning. That is water other than the water. It doesn't mean the water exactly. It may mean life, it may mean danger, it may mean sustainer, it may mean many things. It may mean uh, your livelihood, water. Understood? So beyond water, what you can understand, it. that means we can use other synonyms, other alternatives to water. So we can mean something else of water. So that is the connotative equivalence. So you see, it has two different other names. One is content invariance, and this one is a stylistic. The keyword. So that is denotative and commentative equivalence. Now, we have text normative equivalence. You know, normative means some norms will be set, and then you have to follow those norms, and it is based on text. So it is related to text types, text normative. I mean, what kind of text actually you are translating? Is it a novel? Is it poem? Is it an essay? Or is it, uh, say, pamphlet related to business? Or is it just a recipe? or it's a manual or manual, whatever it is. So that is the text type you have to decide. So on the basis of that text type, you will translate. So that is the text normative equivalence because I cannot text plays as I will translate novels because novels are text that are two different genres and we have to treat them differently while translating. As we treat them while reading it in the original language and the target language, similarly, we have to treat it differently while actually we are translating it into a um, target language. So we have to consider it in that way. All right? Sir. Uh, please excuse me. Uh, I'll be come back to you. Just wait for a minute. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. As I was saying, the text normative equivalence actually de it depends on the types of the text. Uh, with different kinds of texts behaving in different ways, I have already explained it to you, so I, 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 I guess that you have got. Now, I'll jump to next, that is pragmatic equivalence. Now, you see the pragmatic equivalence or communicative equivalence is oriented towards the receiver of the text or message. This is, it is dynamic equivalence. You remember the dynamic equivalence and formative equivalence we talked about it the other day? You see, the pragmatic equivalence, it depends on the receiver. That is the way the readers, they think about it. So what will be their experience after reading the translation? So it will be considered earlier and accordingly it will be translated. So it depends on the communicative equivalence. That is how actually the text, the source text, it's going to be communicated or it's going to be understood or received by the readers. Understood? That's it's very practical. It's very, it's based on utility. Because uh, if you just consider the stakeholders, then the, uh, I mean the writer, the original writer or the original author of the source text, he is the first person in the, I mean the stakeholders, 
he is one of the stakeholders or the shareholders you can see in this whole process then the translator and then we have the reader so you see we have three different stakeholders included while actually we're translating one is the translator uh, i mean the original author himself the translator and the readers so readers are the end at the end so they're at the end of these uh, stakeholders in this whole process so we're going to consider their case first and accordingly we'll translate so that is pragmatic equivalence then formal equivalence uh, you can see it says that which is related to the form and aesthetic of the text includes what plays and the individual stylistics features of the source text so you see we are going to uh, we are going to analyze the source text and its features the stylistic features that means is different kinds of forms the word plays and morphological stuff syntactic stuff all these things actually we are going to consider in the formal equivalence and accordingly we will try to fix the form for the target text or target line so it is elsewhere referred to as expressive equivalence and it is and is not to be confused with leaders so that is expressive equivalence it's not exactly the formative equivalence of leaders the pragmatic equivalence is uh, i mean just like the leaders dynamic equivalence but formal equivalence is not exactly the formative equivalence as it has been suggested by me as we've seen in our previous lecture okay now here it goes now color goes on to identify different types of equivalence in terms of the research FOSI, FOSI means the focus, that's a plural form of focus, let's FOSI. These are summarized in table 3.3, so having discussed these types and the phenomena related to them, followed that importantly, highlights how this can aid the translator and what the role of uh, translation theory is. Now, this is very important and very interesting indeed, that what is going to be the translator's role and how actually it is going to help uh, explain the translation theory in the following chart we'll find and it is also developed by Polo. Uh, uh, let me jump to this. It's very tiny. I can't help, I can't help with that. Thing. Can you see it in any way on your screen? I'm sorry for the uh, for this tiny shape. Yes, sir, we can see. Is it visible in any way? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay, so you see, the, uh, in the first column we have parameter, in second column we have semantic translation, in the third one we have communicative translation. So you see the transmitter address, uh, I mean, uh, addressy focus. Addressy focus means the person I'm addressing to. So, for example, in this lecture, I'm addressing to you. So, you are the addressees. Understood? Got it? Yes, I am I, I'm addressing to you, so you are the addresses. So you see the transmitter addressee, focus. Focus on the thought process of the transmitter as an individual. Should only help target text reader with connotations. So you see, I'm considering the target text readers. That means, for example, when I'm translating the text from English to Bengali, so I'm, I'm the translator, I'm translating it for you. So you people are the target text reader. So I'm considering your case. Uh, uh, because uh, it is transmitted to you. So, if they are a crucial part of the message, so certainly, I mean, uh, uh, while actually we're doing the translation work, so you are the crucial part of the translation, this whole process. In a communicative translation, it, that is semantic, because I'm considering the connotative and denotative meaning. Remember, semantics actually deals with the meaning. Then, when actually you deal with the meaning, you have to think about the words, lax, I mean, that is a la uh, I mean, the lexical stuff, or lexis, and then also you have to consider the meaning of the whole sentence, okay? So it actually, it deals with the meaning, that is semantic. On the other hand, communicative translation, it depends on the communication, whether the idea, it has been communicated from the target text to the source text, uh, from the source text to the target text, sorry. Now, subjective, that is very much subjective, that is individual, it depends on the subject, very much personal. Target text reader focused, it is focused on the target text, uh, target text reader, that means I'm translating as a translator from English to Bengali, so you are the target text reader. So it is focused on you. Oriented towards a specific language and culture. So where actually I am, it is very much pragmatic, or you can say based on utility, because I'm thinking about the readers, cultures and traditions, so their language also I have to consider. So I have to consider our Bengali language, Bangla language, and also I have to consider our culture. And accordingly, actually, I have to make it suitable for the readers like you, if I'm the translator. Then the culture, you can see, remains within the source language culture. 
So when actually you depend on the semantic translation on the base of this, and if you want to consider the culture, then remains within the source language culture. So there is no that there is no such changes, not that much changes that, that we expect in the communicative translation. Because here you keep the source language culture as it is. I mean, very close to the original text. On the other hand, the communicative translation culture transfers foreign elements into the target language culture. See, in the communicative translation, I will make it, I will make it suitable for the Bangladeshi readers. Okay, or uh, you can see the, I mean, the people who are speaking Bangla. So we will try to keep the source text or source languages culture and tradition, we'll transform it into the Bengali culture and tradition. We'll keep it, keep balance between these two. I will not use completely the source language culture and tradition because my readers do not understand it. If they're not familiar with the culture and tradition of the source languages. For example, if I say something about, uh, I mean, for example, uh, Afrikaans. Afrikaans is a language it is used by the South African people. It's a tribal language and also it's commonly used by the African people as a lingua franca. So if I translate a text, for example, I'm a speaker of Afrikaans. And if I translate a text from the Afrikaans to Bangla, and I, if I keep the, I mean, the source language and culture and traditions, everything there as it is, my Bangla readers or Bengali readers, they will find it very difficult to understand because they are not familiar with the language and also the culture as well. Understood? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Then also we have to consider the parameter is time and origin. At what time I'm translating and what is the origin of that text? So not fixed in any time or local space, translation needs to be done anew with every generation. You see, it is, it is not, I mean, it is not time bound that I cannot translate from 100 years back. I can translate from any part of, uh, from any uh, particular period of time. So I can translate anything. And it's not time bound at the same time, translation needs to be done and new with every generation. This is the very important point to remember. That for example, it, a, a, a translation work that has been done from English to Bengali maybe 100 years back, from English to Bengali. But you see the Bangla language, it has been changed a lot. The spelling, context, situation, political situation, geographical situation, our culture and traditions, educational system, our society, it has been changed a lot in the, I mean, in the last 100 years. So if you use the same translation which has been done 50 or 100 years back, sometimes you'll find that, that people like us from these generations will not find it that much interesting because of the linguistic phenomenon and language. সামাজিক অবস্থান আমাদের রাজনীতি সব চেঞ্জ হয়ে যাওয়া আমাদের ভাষাগত ভাবে যথেষ্ট পরিবর্তন হয়েছে এমনকি আমরা রিসেন্টলি দেখেছি যে বাংলা একটা কি করেছে তাদের ভাষাগত পরিবর্তন করেছে বানানের শব্দের ক্ষেত্রে শব্দের নতুন নতুন অর্থ আসছে সুতরাং আগে যে শব্দ যে মিল করতো এখন অত সে শব্দটা সেই মিল করে আগের যে বানানগুলো ছিল আমি ওই টেক্সটটা দেখলে আমার কাছে মনে হবে যে বানানগুলো সব ভুল আমি খুব বাধাগ্রস্ত হবো করতে কষ্ট হবে বোঝাতে পেরেছি বিষয়টা জি স্যার যে কারণে এই সিমান্টিক ট্রান্সলেশন যুগে যুগে তারা কি করে নতুন নতুন ওই একই ট্রান্সলেশন আবার নতুন করে তারা ডিমান্ড করে যে ট্রান্সলেশন চলবে এটা অনেক শেখে নতুন করে করতে হবে একই টেক্সট ওকে On the other hand, communicative translation is ephemeral and rooted in its own contemporary context. So you can understand it. if one is, uh, I mean, for a longer period of time, but here you see it's ephemeral, it's very much temporary. It's not nothing permanent. So we have to translate it and it's rooted in its own contemporary context. So we have to consider our contemporary Bangladeshi situations. So accordingly, you have to translate it. Otherwise, people will not find it. That much easy to understand because they will not find the reference. Amra jodi prashen do bata, but relevance kuje na pai. Bhartho man shomai kori pekhi the. Oye onu bata pore, tomar ikcho karo lagbe na the bhartho chai. Jono shomu shomai kotha ke chinta kore translation kora ekta guru to bahu kore. Is that okay? Is that okay, dear students? Yes, sir. Excellent. Now we have relation to source text. Relation to success always inferior to source text. 
loss of meaning. So in, may, in many cases, what we do, source text of meaning taken inferior, it a book could be shine now, even on a shine, would also the Hario translation. In communicative translation, may be better than the source text, gain of flows and clarity, even if loss of semantic content. So semantic content or semantically, it might sound different, but the gain of force, the force of the translation, the authenticity of the translation, or the power of translation, you can feel it, the elegance, the grace of translation, you can feel it, that it is more clear than, than the previous translation, I mean the semantic translation. It is, the clarity is there because we are already adjusted the source text or the or, or you can say the original text to the I mean target languages I mean, target languages you can see that they are cultural and tradition that's why it's very clear it, the clarity is there it are a comprehensive electronic I'm a reader sorry now use of form of source source language and source language form if source text language doms deviate then this must be uh, replicated in the target text loyalty to source text author so you see loyalty to source text author is demanded it's there it's important even if you deviate even if there is lots of deflection then this must be this must be replicated in the target text if the source text form is deviated there in the target text it must be reproduced it must be replicated there Understood the source text said J loyal to the shit of maintain for a chista of the wall. It said I'm a target sex for Russia. So loyal to source text, source text author is important in the semantic translation. On the other end, the communicative translation, although you can guess it, but it's going to happen. Respect for the for the form of the source language is there, but overriding the loyalty to translate uh, target language norms. You see, overriding will override the loyalty to target language. So you don't have to be 100% loyal to the source text or the source text author. You can take the liberty, obviously, when you want to consider your own culture and tradition, certainly you are going to deviate. There must be some changes will be there. And you cannot avoid it. That is unavoidable because you have taken the liberty to adjust it, to make it suitable for the target readers. And accordingly, have made some changes according to the culture and tradition. So obviously, it's going to take I hope you understand. Now, form of the target line. Whether actually we're going to use the form of the target line. Now, more complex, upward, detailed, concentrated tendency to over translate. So, here actually, out of consciousness, you try to over translate. That means that is more authentic than the target language. So, we are trying to do it. But on the other hand, in the communicative translation, you can see it's smoother, simpler, clearer, more direct, more conventional, and tendency to understate. Because there is a tendency to understand why? Because I'm trying to make it suitable for my readers. And accordingly, I'm just trying to customize it according to the needs of the, I mean, the I mean, target text readers. So that's actually, I am making it very simple. And I'm trying to translate, I'm, I'm making the translation work. It's very, that is when the readers, they will read it, they will find it very smooth. Because it's very close to their language and also, they can find the relevance. They have the reference to the, to, I mean, the uh, source text because it's uh, in between the target text and the source text. So that's why they find it very smooth and clear and very easy to understand. And it's more conventional. Conventional means it's very close to the target, uh, target text language, the target language. That is conventional. Then appropriateness for serious literature, autobiography, for example, autobiography, personal effusion, uh, any important political, uh, I mean, a statement, you see, we, we try to keep it as it is, and that is uh, semantical, actually, we cannot change it that much. For the vast majority of texts, for example, non-literary writing, technical and informative texts and publicity, actually, we are using this, I mean, uh, we use this appropriateness. So we consider it in this way. Appropriateness means So we understand it now. The criterion of evaluation, for evaluation, how actually we'll evaluate the text, how actually we can do it. Accuracy of reproduction of the significance of source text. So accuracy of reproduction of significance of source text. So we have to consider the accuracy of the source text. On the other hand, accuracy of communication of the source text, massive in target. So we are considering more on the accuracy of the communication stuff, that whether the main idea, it has been communicated from the target uh, source text to the target text. So accuracy of communication of source text, masses in target text. Whether the so source text message, it has been carried on in the target text, 
that is our main focus. Communication is our main focus. That's that. Okay, is it clear now? So if you just read it by yourself, I hope that you can find it more relevant and you can understand it better. Still, if you have confusion, you can talk to me anytime. Now, here I'll just uh, um, finish my today's lecture with this slide. Here you see the crucial point again is that the equivalences need to be hierarchically ordered according to the communicative situation. We have to order these equivalents either hierarchically. That, that means which one will come first? If you want to find the equivalence, Amra target text says Shate, Amar source text says Judy Eka, equivalence, Bar Shambuta, Judy established for Chester, Duja language, Kumjaka, the Kato Kasakati Anak, Che Kasakati Anbar Kasti Kutte, Abadaki Chesta Kutabije, Amra Aki Kuntaki Kasakati for Chester, Kunt equivalence again. Though there are debates, to be Abushi Bolta Jena Saramaka theatre is important. You can do it because you're the translator, and as an academician, you can take that liberty. There is no such a hard and fast it's not fixed. I can change it, you can change it, because your point of view is different, my point of view is different, okay? So I think we can change it, but this is the very briefly of our general idea, of our general purpose we can use it. And later on, you can just change the hierarchy uh, according to your uh, priorities or your, your, your choices. So here we see the first thing, uh, that this is the checklist for, uh, for the translationally relevant text analysis under the headings of this way. That means translationally, whether actually we can find it relevant, and if you really want to uh, consider the function of these communic communicative situations, how actually we can put them, this hierarchy, equivalence and stuff. First, you can think about language function, that how does it function, how, how it functions. Then you can go for the content characteristics, the content of the source text and the target text, how actually you can uh, I mean, transmit the content from the source text to the target text. Then also you can consider the language stylistic characteristics, you can consider it on it. And also formal aesthetic characteristics, you can consider on it, and then pragmatic characteristics. For example, I can choose this one. Depending on the genres of the text, for example, for novel, I can go for the content. This is my choice. Even for poetry, I can go for the content first. If I see that the content of this poem is so important that if I focus on the language function, that the content of that poem, it might lose in lose the touch with the source text or the meaning of the so, I mean, the uh, target, uh, I, mean, I mean, look at the original poem, it might lose if I focus on the language function. So in that case, I will give priority to the content characteristics. So I will try to fix the content first, then I'll go for the function. Do you understand what I'm saying? That how can I fix the priority or hierarchy? Is it clear? Yes, sir. So it's yes, your sir. choice. Yes. But generally, generally, this is the checklist. But you can change it according to your suit. Okay. All right, now, if you have any question uh, about uh, today's lecture, so I'll give you a few minutes. So any question or any observation, otherwise I'd like to call it a day so we can finish it uh, here. So any observation? Any observation? Uh, any questions, any opinion, anything? Anything you'd like to add? Dear students, sorry, I forgot to talk to me. If you have, say no. If you, uh, if you don't have, say no. If you have, then just raise your questions. Sure. Anything else? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, then in that case, I'd like to finish up today's discussion and thank you very much for your participation and for your patience. Hope to see you inshallah next time. Okay. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can hear. I can hear. Any question? Please um, send the record. Inshallah. Because I, I'll do that. I'll do that. Sir. I will send you the recording, okay? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Okay, right. so Take care of us. Bye. Bye.